Bienvenidos, señoras y señores, to another episode of the Bleed Lows Podcast. This episode of the Bleed Lows Podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your betting needs. Get the latest odds, lines, and matchup reports for baseball, football, college football, boxing, golf, and more. Bet Online continues to be the fastest and easiest way to place your wagers, including live betting, and your favorite casino and card games are available to play right from your phone. So head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and get in on the action. Remember to use your promo code BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, where the game starts. And joining us on the Carne Asada is a former major leaguer. He is also the host of Deuces Wild with Will Clark and The Daily Hustle, which you can listen to on the No Filter Network. Uh, he is El Principe of Redwood City. Uh, he is Eric Burns. Eric, ¿cómo estás? Bienvenido, amigo. Uh, hola, ¿qué lo que hay? ¿Qué pasa, güey? <laughs> I love it. I love when you guys show off your Spanish. Well, you know what? I played five years in Dominican. And so every time I would come to bat, the guy would come on there and he'd go, um, President, there's some cerveza. How about the Polos Tigres? Jardino uh, Izquierda, Enrique Barrenes. So he'd fuck up my name every time. So the entire Dominican would call me Enrique Barrenes. And it was cool, though. I just went with it. So I'm assuming you use that as your pseudonym when you check into hotels. 100%. I, that is it. I mean, I, I actually, every single morning when I start the Daily Hustle podcast, I do it just like that. I say, Presidente, es mejor cerveza. I'd say, right, right now, we got dad water, mom water, dad water. So it's behind me. So it's one of our sponsors, right? So, and I go... <laughs> and it's to screw around and then i'll introduce myself as enrique byroness and let's roll with it it's, look it, it was funny I was, I was telling my kid too it's 12 he plays like national travel ball and whatnot and he's starting to play some teams and he went down to mexico he was on the 12 U, uh, usa team that went down there and i'm like bro like you got to learn how to drive with these guys. Like it's, you know, it's important in the sense that you'll be able to communicate with your teammates and whether you're perfect at it or not, it doesn't matter. As long as you give it an attempt, they're going to love you for it. So I felt like my relationship with all the Latin American ball players was way better than the average American ball player, just because I attempted to speak the language and then eventually got to the point where, you know, I, I was really good at it. And I even went so far as to do translations for interviews and whatnot. So I, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's, you know, Tori Lavello talks about it with a connected team is a dangerous team. Well, part of connecting a team is bringing the culture together because in any clubhouse, these guys will tell you it's pretty divided between the Latin American players and the American players. And then within the American players, then you have your sub clicks from there. So the clicks are always going to be there and it's okay, but how do you unify them as well as possible? The teams that do that are the teams that end up winning. Eric, I, I want to follow up on that. Uh, when you say that, you know, these, these clubhouses are mixed, you know, you got a lot of Latin players. I, I want to get into the world series matchup, but really you know, now there's a lot of Asian players. I mean, baseball has become international. That is the, the the way I think the sport is growing. How is it when you guys are in that clubhouse? You guys embrace your differences? Is it very easy to acclimate with all the different languages being spoken in a clubhouse? Not really. It's difficult because you have – a guy that you say you play with that happens to be from Japan and there's not going to be a whole lot of in-depth conversations and connections <laughs> happening. Now I had the incredible opportunity to play with Ichiro and he was my throwing partner every single day of spring training. And, you know, people will tell you like he knows a lot more English than he lets on and he does, but 
it's still pretty limited. But I, I, we had a connection in the way that he liked to play catch, and I like to play catch. It was aggressive. It was fast. Started at like 45 feet within five throws. We're at 90. Next thing you know, we're at 180. Next thing you know, we're at 300. And we're playing long. Everyone else is at 90 feet. He's at 300 feet. And I mean, there's this universal language that this, yeah, okay. But <laughs> you guys have to understand, like everywhere he went, he had a translator with him, obviously. But beside the translator, you also had the media circus that surrounded him. Now, this isn't the case for every player that, you know, is say is from Japan. We also had on my fall league team in Arizona one time, had a, we had a guy that was from Korea and we had another guy that was from Japan. And I guess, I don't know the, you know, two countries conflict or whatever. And so they ended up getting in a fight and I mean, just weird sort of stuff that you wouldn't even think about, but typically baseball is the one thing that unifies everybody uh, but it's also naive to think that you're going to have a group of guys from all over the world and you expect them to just perfectly gel in a short period of time because it it's hard and i think mlb is making it a lot easier and now i do like how they're doing the post-game interviews with the guys to their to say number one language is spanish they'll do them in spanish and then translate it because it makes the guys a lot more comfortable uh, in, in doing that instead of forcing them to try to speak English. So, you know, overall, you know, when you're trying to create a winning culture, that, you know, number one, you need great players. And so that's what teams are trying to do. They're trying to get the best players from all over the world. And then from there, it's trying to figure out how you put them in the best position to succeed and also get them to gel as well as possible. So before we go to the World Series, I want to get your outsider's perspective. How, what do you think is going on with the Dodgers in the postseason? I, I, I Look, we've been very critical of analytics uh, out here. You know, we think, you know, analytics, it works great during the regular season, but it's been yet to been proven to work in the postseason. Is it as simple as that? Or what are you seeing where a team repeatedly looks like a completely different team in the postseason? Your bats went cold. You saw it happen to the Phillies overnight. Same thing. You can't have Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman not hitting. Those are the two staples at the top of the lineup, and the entire offense thrives off of their success. And so when those guys go cold, you guys are in trouble. And it's just bad timing. There's no other way to put it. Over the course of 162-game season, sure, it's an ultra marathon. When you get to the postseason, it's a sprint. And if you're not having your best day, you're in trouble. And I think that's why you see what we've seen here this postseason with the Rangers and the Diamondbacks, who both limped into the postseason, finding their way into a World Series. But you don't have to look any further than Philadelphia. I mean, this is a team that they went ice cold in the middle of a series. And as soon as that happened, the Diamondbacks took advantage of it. Why? Because they were putting the ball in play. They're putting pressure on the defense. They're stealing bases or making plays. You can't be so one-dimensional. Now, not to say that the Dodgers are one-dimensional, but they did rely a lot on that offense that was just lethal in the regular season. So when that offense goes cold, what are you left with? So uh, there really is no offense to the slum. Right? I mean, you just hope work in the postseason, Eric, or is it just, there's just not enough time? Uh, I think that through the course of a regular season, you have the opportunity to get in your early work, uh, implement something. You're not afraid to try something new. If my hands were here and I, I was coming to here, you know what? Let's, let's just take them here. Let's just start here. So my move's going to simplify. Does that make sense? It's just yeah. like, there's little things that you can do. And then you go and you work on it in your early work. And then you work on it during batting practice. And then you get into the game and you're like, okay, that's it. Well, you get in the postseason, 
it's like, damn, like everything speeds up on you. You're trying to, you're, 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 you're doing everything you can to be successful. But at the same time, you're like, man, I better dance with the girl that I brought And <laughs> You know, the game of baseball is all, is all about adjustments. Everyone's going to tell you that even adjustments that we don't see these players make say Mookie Betts, for example, because he, I've seen him go, I, you know, ice cold before. And then I seen him get red hot and he has a lot of moving parts. I got to believe he makes adjustments all the time. So it becomes a little bit more difficult. I wouldn't trip on your Dodgers. It's like they're the Astros of the National League. It's each and every single year you can count on them for, for being there. Now, they haven't had as much success, obviously, as the Astros have in appearing in seven straight American League Championship Series games. But in order to get to where you want to go, you have to do what the Dodgers have been doing year in and year out. And I... As much as people want to trip on them and they're not happy because of the post, I, I don't know what to tell you guys, but be thankful you're getting there because you, you could be the San Francisco Giants and win 107 one year and be absolutely dog shit the next. That's what they're dealing with. Would you rather have that? I don't think so. Uh, that, that is the question. Eric, I want to I wanna talk to you because you brought this up on your show, The, the Daily Hustle, uh, about Dodger fan taking over uh, Citizens Bank ballpark. As a player, when you see the opposing team come out there, and you see it in the NFL out here in L.A. all the time, whenever the Chargers or the Rams have a home game, it's basically a home game for the visiting team. Uh, but as a baseball player, what does it feel to see another team's fan base take over your ballpark? This sucks. Yeah, and yeah it, it's basically Chase Field in Arizona. I it dealt with it each and every season I was with the Diamondbacks and we play the Dodgers. We even you know, the Padres travel the well because it's so close. We, we, you know, we'd be playing the Padres and you're like, dude, are we in San Diego? It's what's going on here? Uh, the Red Sox, the Yankees, the Dodgers, and the Cubs are the top four. Those fans travel like no other. So I guess if you're an LA sports fan in general. You can look at the Dodgers and as your stadiums get taken over by all these other NFL teams <laughs> and, and, and whatnot, you could, you could find solace in the fact that your Dodger fans are taking over ballparks around the country. I think one of the things, that, you know, and I, I said this and went off on this and it's probably the post you're referring to, which was, you know, the, the Diamondbacks needed to step up because when I was there, they actually – would have a message on the scoreboard that would say, welcome to an evening of Diamondbacks baseball. And it's just like, what? Like, we're not going to the prom here. This is stupid. How about welcome to the fucking snake pit, right? <laughs> That's the mentality that we want to have as a fan base. And they've never had that. Now, Arizona's had its issues because... Number one, they've only been in existence since 1998. Number two, they have one World Series, but it it was pretty much a bot World Series with Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling, and there wasn't this long time to fall in love with this team. I was on a team in Arizona that went to the National League Championship Series against the Rockies. We big underdog we uh, against the Cubs ended up winning that series. That was a fun team. That was an anybody, anytime team. That was a team that reminds me a lot of this group because we weren't expected to do much. You know, the previous year we weren't great. The previous year before that we were even worse. And so you got to rally around this team. Well, with that builds a fan base. So I like to think that we helped build this fan base. But the thing is, is that there's so many transplants there that you're everybody's second favorite team. And now my argument was that 2001, the people who got to grow up with that and see that, you know, those people are now 30 years old. Like this is your fan base. Now you guys saw world series. I don't want an excuse about, Oh, I like the Cubs and the diamondbacks are my second favorite team. That's bullshit. You guys grew up with them. Now the guy who grew up in Chicago or the guy that grew up before Arizona had a team, so he was rooting for the Cubs. I can understand that. But now, not this group. So if you guys notice, in the postseason at least, 
the Diamondbacks fans have been terrific. Well, I'll, I'll, let's let's transition into the World Series. I I'm rooting for the Serpientes. I feel like their brand of baseball, the fact that they steal bases, they manufacture runs. There's constant. It feels like constant action on the on, on the field. I think they have a fighting chance against the Rangers. Everybody seems to be falling in love with the fact that the Rangers have so much power in that lineup. I mean, I never thought the Serpientes would do to the Phillies what they did. And you said adjustments. I mean, they deserve all the accolades they're getting because for them to shut down that lineup, especially in game six and seven, I I mean, we're sleeping on the Serpientes, aren't we, Eric? Yeah, so basically the Diamondbacks have been getting this done with – an effective bullpen and a relentless offense. Now, you know, Brandon fought fat, call him whatever you want. <laughs> he's been, he's been terrific. He did not have a great regular season. It's got good stuff, but the bullpen is really interesting because in a day and age where you look at bullpens around major league baseball, most of those pins have multiple guys that throw 95 to 104 miles per hour. The Diamondbacks have one, Kevin Ginkle, and he's absolutely filthy. Take him away. And their main guys all throw 91 miles per hour. So it goes to show me that they know how to pitch. They're working the top of the zone. They're changing eye levels. They're mixing speeds. Don't sleep on Dan Heron, former teammate of mine, good buddy of mine. He's the pitching coordinator for the Diamondbacks, the strategist who basically puts together a game plan of how they want to attack each hitter. Now, give a lot of love to the Diamondbacks bullpen for going out there and executing it. But they've done a fantastic job. And the fact that you got a guy like Paul Sewell, he was a throwaway from the Mariners. Mariners didn't even want him anymore. And now this guy has got balls of steel going into the biggest moments, going right after the Bryce Harpers of the world, saying, here, hit it, 91, top of the zone. And he's getting pop-ups, he's getting fly balls, he's getting swings and misses. So uh, this is, it's an effective bullpen. It, it really is. And they may not be pretty, um, and they're not sexy with their velocities or anything else, but they're definitely doing a, a terrific job. And if they're going to have any chance of winning the series, they're going to have to keep doing what they're doing. So who who are you picking? Uh, I see the series going six or seven games, six at least. If there was one bet I was going to make, I said this last night or a couple nights ago on Deuces Wild. It, it basically, I'm really, really confident. And I think you'd almost have to put up like two to one to to get these uh, to make you know I, to actually get this bet. I would be shocked if this series is done in five or under. So basically, I would say this series is going six or seven. To take it a step further, you go ahead and like, you know, because I think you would get plus money if you're betting on a plus, you know, a series going seven games. But that's how I see it. I don't see one distinct advantage uh, for the team over the other. I could say the snakes. I just, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to root for them. But I also have a ton of rooting interest for the Bruce Bochy story. Uh, I, Bruce and I were hanging out at Will Clark's retirement ceremony uh, just over a year ago. And, you know, I was having the conversation with him like, yo, like you want to get back in? Cause he just looked great. And, and you could feel his energy when he talked about the game and I could tell that he still loved it. And he's like, Bernsey, he goes, if the right opportunity was there, I'd get back in. And like a month after that is when he took the job with Texas. So I I'm rooting for him as well. Um, you know, overall, I, I think it, the, the Rangers bats are more susceptible. Does that make sense? And I, I think the Diamondbacks pen is better. The Rangers bats are more prone to slumping. D backs in seven. That's it. I mean, that's, that's, that's the call. Uh, Eric, I do want to just ask you a couple questions before we wrap things up and get your opinion on it. There's been a lot of people that have been making a big stink about this playoff format, blaming the fact that these number one seeds went down 
I don't think this play mar- playoff format is going to change because there's just too much money involved in it. Is there a way Matt Money Smith out here, a local radio host, I think put a had put out a proposition to bring back the one game wild card, but then allow the division winners to play all their games at home in the next series. That would be truly rewarding the teams that win the division. Does there need to be an adjustment made, a fix to this? Yeah, I think there definitely needs to be an adjustment made. But, you know, really, I think you would actually add two more teams and then that would get the top seeds playing. And then you do a best of three and you basically have those be home games for the higher seats. So what happens? Oh yeah. You know what you can, I don't, maybe go best of five even for that first series, just because in a short series, like a best of three, it becomes a little bit, anybody could be anybody. The more games you play, obviously gives the better chance uh, to win to the better team. But it was very much proven that the teams that had to sit out got screwed and baseball players are creatures of habit. They are used to playing on a daily basis. And so them sitting back while these other teams are in the thick of it, playing these series, it just doesn't do well for them. And so in order to even the playing field a little bit, you know what? Screw it. Let's add two more teams. I, I think that's awesome. It keeps all of these fan bases interested and then put that one team, whoever the higher seat is, all home games and go from there. But I, I think that's one way to try to counteract it. Uh, last one. Uh, you have great shows, Deuces Wild and then uh, the Daily Hustle on the No Filter Network. Did you always, I mean, you've done work as an analyst in the past. Did you always see you were going to end up in the media at one point, once you were done playing baseball? Because you're a natural. It's something that I've always loved. When I was a kid, I wanted to do two things with my life. I wanted to play sports and I wanted to talk about sports. And I always enjoyed the debate. I always enjoyed all of the conversations that were had. I grew up listening to KMBR 680, the sports leader in San Francisco. I listened to LA shows. I mean, I'd listen to Vince Scully at night. I, the, the, you know, the way the radio works where I, I think it was, I'll say 690 or 710 where I would tune in and I listen yeah. to the Dodgers broadcast. My aunt, every summer I'd go and stay with my aunt Patty and we'd go to Dodge. We'd find a homestand and I'd go to the Dodger game every day. We'd go sit in the left field bleachers and, just awesome memories. I mean, overall, I'm just a, a big sports fan, just like anybody else. And uh, I knew when I got done, I, this is what I wanted to do. So I started with ESPN and did some college baseball work with them. And then just as MLB network was getting going and I can't thank MLB and, you know, also Fox and ESPN and all those opportunities that I got to uh, experience. And that's kind of honed me into the broadcaster I am today, but, Ultimately, I've always been somebody who I I want to I want to speak at least what my truth is perceived to be. I don't want to hold back. And in television, whether you're working for you know Major League Baseball or Fox or ESPN, you always have someone in your ear telling you what you can and cannot say. So when we came up with the concept and idea of no filter and just letting it fly, I, I think you know the number one. The number one trait any broadcaster can have is authenticity and and a realness. And it allowed us beyond all the F-bombs and everything we get to drop, it's allowed us to just be real. And I think that's the most important thing with the network. We're also an open platform. So anybody can come on and create. And with that, we're giving a voice to anybody, anytime. And that's exactly, I, I think what the sports world's all about, not to mention the fact it's live, it's interactive. So we're pulling people in and out of our shows and they're getting to, it's like talk radio on, you know, on the internet and having these conversations, but that's the beauty about sports. It, it, it really is. I, I don't know where you find the time to do all this stuff. Not only do you have those shows, 
Uh, your documentary, the Let Them Play, uh, uh, you know, following you doing a triathlon. And now, right before we came on, I mean, I don't think you were joking. You do literally run like 20 miles a day, don't you? I'll do 20 a day, yeah. That, that's that's the number. So, yeah, I just got into endurance sports. That was a way to find whatever physical uh, void that I had in my life from playing baseball. I turned into uh, the endurance world and got super in. I started with one sprint triathlon. I had no fucking idea what I was doing. And then that went from, you know, the sprint triathlon then led to doing 12 Ironmans, which then led to doing ultra marathons, the Western States 100, uh, and then a triathlon across uh, the country, which we, you know, did to raise money for or let them play foundation all about getting kids outside, especially underprivileged kids that don't have the opportunity to play. Uh, don't have the resources. And so we did that, raised a bunch of money, did this 24 hour world record golf uh, event that raised, uh, you know, some more money uh, doing that. And then, you know, got into uh, recently have gotten into pickleball and got a, 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 a our next fundraiser is going to revolve around playing a pickleball for an extensive period of time, uh, which I think we'll have some fun with. So, yeah, I mean, overall, just trying to stay active and I guess what keeps my mind right, guys. Like, I don't, I, you know, I, we all operate differently, but that's, that's what allows me to come here and have a conversation with you guys and make sense. Have you always had this energy since you were a kid? I, yeah. Yeah. I, so obviously you could think that back to like my youth or my childhood, it was, it was difficult because I had a tough time sitting still. <laughs> you get kicked out of class all the time, talk too much, all the bullshit. But I was, I'm not ADHD before anyone knew what ADHD was. And I, I was diagnosed with it at like nine years old, which the one thing I'm grateful for is it, I've always had that ability to hyper focus. So when I have something, that's why, you know, if you do a show like this or whatever, and, and play sports too, where I, I can really kind of hone it in. And then the question becomes, how do I fill the other spots? And so activity has always been my way to, to fill that, but it's, you know, we all, we all, we all have something that we deal with and it's a matter of, you know, what's the, what's the most efficient, effective way to deal with the, the hand that we've been dealt um, and put it to good use. So I, I feel like I've, I've done a pretty decent job with that. I wasn't even talking about it. I, I was referring more to your physical energy. I mean, the, the fact you, you you play sports, you do the endurance, and then you still have time to do these shows. I, I, I mean, what's the recipe? You know, whatever so, goes, you, whatever you goes, most, selling it. It's Newton's law, though. Like, it's whatever, you know, goes in motion tends to stay in motion, right? So the, okay. as soon as I, as, as soon as I shut it down at the end of the night, I'm done. Like, that's it. But I don't. <laughs> I mean, from the time I get up at typically five 30 until I get in bed, let's call it 11 o'clock, 1130. Um, if I'm not having, you know, multiple tequilas and, you know, fist pumping, uh, with, you know, with my boys out at a concert or something like, no, it's like, that's, that's one of those things. I just try to, I just try to keep going. It's when you, when all of a sudden you, you take too many of those down times and rest periods and everything else, it's, I've never been a big napper, let's just say. All right. So you're a shark. You just constantly got to be moving. That that makes sense. It, uh, it helps. It helps. You're, you're a UCLA guy, so I'm going to leave you with this as we end the show. We got to know, you know, we're big on tacos here on this show. You know, it's, it's about the taco culture here. So we want to know what is your favorite taco and where do you go to get that taco? All right. So right there, I mean, I, you got, I'm not sure how well you guys can see my, I have a taco like light up sign <laughs> and here we go. You can't make everyone happy. You're not a taco. Tacos are the number one uh, joy in my life when it comes to food. If I, if there's one food I can eat for the rest of my life, every single day, just be a taco. I, I eat tacos, tacos, tacos. So I do appreciate the standard street tacos, carne asada, sprinkle a little, uh, you know, cheese on there, whatever. But so my family has a, a, a family recipe when it comes to the tacos, the whole family, my whole family is from Southern California, by the way. Uh, so Annabelle, who was my grandmother would make these tacos and you take a corn tortilla 
and you put American cheese inside the corn tortilla. You then have your your seasoned ground beef uh, with you know like the taco se- you know seasoning in there, and then you put the ground beef in the corn tortilla that already has the American cheese at the bottom, and then and then you fry them, and then ah. yes, and then you fry them on both sides. You get the cheese that turns into like this burnt cheese. It's so fucking good. And then from there, you take the lettuce, the shredded, really nice, thin shredded lettuce with like a, a vinegar, you know, on, on, on top of it. Then you put the, you stuff with the lettuce and then you take more cheese and put that cheese on top. And then we have a special recipe, family recipe for the salsa that we make. Add in the extra jalapenos. Of course, that's how I like it. Extra spicy. And you got yourself the most fantastic taco meal you've ever had. I, I literally would eat those tacos every single day. Every single day. I just asked my wife. I says, honey, tacos tonight? Tacos tonight? And they're kind of a pain <laughs> in the ass to make, so she never wants to make them. But you know, at least once a week, we're, uh, we're grubbing on those tacos. And there you have it, the Burns Taco. Eric, we want to thank you for coming on the show. We love your energy. We love what you're doing at the No Filter Network. You're a, a voice that uh, is needed because in an age where you have media, team-controlled media, you, you don't get a, you don't get the other opinion. You, you get the message the team wants to get out. So uh, we thank you very much for coming on the show, man. Awesome, guys. Appreciate you guys having me. Keep doing what you're doing. This episode of the Bleed Lows podcast has been brought to you by betonline.ag, where the game starts. Hey, 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 hey.